Hi, and welcome to Somatic Wise, where people and nature can heal each other through somatic psychotherapy and eco-psychology. Today's video is on stress, anxiety, and COVID-19. We are in a very unusual situation across the globe right now with the spread of COVID-19 and the precautions that everybody has to take to prevent it from spreading too rapidly, overwhelming our service delivery and supply systems. So it occurred to me that it could be helpful to make a video sort of elucidating some of these unusual nuances to our situation and how they affect our internal well-being, that is our mental health and our self-regulation, and begin to explore some potentially helpful practices for best coping with it. So stay tuned. So I'm recording this video from the perspective of somebody who lives in an industrialized country, a modern Western industrialized country. And for me, we're living in unprecedented times. I don't know that there's anybody alive today who remembers the Spanish flu of 1918, where worldwide we lost 50 million people, which is a lot of people, in the US 675,000. And furthermore, Western civilization has changed considerably since that time. So this is pretty unique and things are unstable and uncertain. I want to take a moment and acknowledge that some of the viewers of this video themselves may be in a lot of grief if you've lost loved ones, if you've lost a business over this, or there's a threat of either one, if people you love are sick, or if you yourself or anybody is uh, experiencing an underlying health condition which could put you at greater risk of dire consequences of this virus. So there's a lot of grief in the air. There's a lot of anxiety. People may be feeling that. Um, some people are reporting sort of an up and down, sort of I got this and no, now everything's really anxious and then I'm kind of back up on a functioning level. So a lot of swings in people's internal experience, their internal response to the greater external circumstances. There's some grief over missing our usual way of life, whether it was supportive of us or maybe not so supportive and stressful. Nonetheless, we tend to get into some daily rhythms and practices which are helpful and comforting to us. And a lot of those are just simply not available right now. I know that I'm dearly missing going to my favorite coffee house with my journal. It's not a good thing to do right now. So. This is enough to make anybody anxious, really. And as we honor our own grief and anxiety, I also think it's important to pause and remember that in non-industrialized countries or impoverished, impoverished countries, people have to deal with uncertainty, including infectious agents, uh, war, things like this more frequently than people in modern Western countries. And if this pandemic shows us anything, it's how connected we are globally, even if we don't pause to remember that, which could be a coping mechanism because the frantic pace of life and the demands on us is usually pretty high. But we are all connected, and it's important to remember people who don't have access to the resources in Western industrialized countries and keep them in our thoughts and keep the intent on helping. Keeping some focus on helping other people that may not have so much access to resources is a win-win situation. Obviously, logistically, anything we can do to help pandemics from starting and spreading in the future is really a good thing. For the individual who might be offering some support in some way, being able to access an, a state of empathy and interconnection usually represents a better state of self-regulation. So if we can access our empathy instead of just our own, narrowing the, the viewpoint on our own survival, that often will bring us out of stress response and into effective action. So not surprisingly, a win-win situation. So 
as we move out of the introduction of this video into some more specific nuances of this situation, just please remember to be gentle with yourselves. If you've got any underlying stress, anxiety, or unresolved post-traumatic stress, it's definitely more likely to be coming up in a world situation that feels less certain and you don't know what's going to happen next. So a lot of people's underlying stuff might be being brought up at this time. Alternately, some people with chronic post-traumatic stress that's not all the way resolved are saying they're actually doing pretty well because for once the external environment matches their internal environment somewhat. So there's a lot of ups and downs that we're all experiencing now, a lot of uh, bigger swings where maybe we're fun focus functioning in this sort of up and down. Now it's like bigger ups and bigger downs. Things feel a little more uh, unstable inside. So just take care of yourselves. And next we're going to talk about a little more specific nuances. Okay, so let's talk about fight, flight, and freeze for a minute. I have a video about stress physiology basics that I'll link below in the description. When our deep reptile brain and our physical body detects a threat, it literally wants to fight, like punch, punch, or run away, like go, 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 or immobilize. I'm going to wait till this is over. It really wants to do that part of it. That's our primal selves. But you can't punch a virus and you can't run away from the economy collapsing. So if our body is stuck in fight and flight, that probably isn't the best response for what we're going through right now. Immobilization or the freeze response may not be a terrible response, but it's really stressful on the body. It's not meant to be a long-term response to stress. And there are times when we do actually need to mobilize. When we do mobilize, we should be very mindful about how we're mobilizing. Are we over the top with it or is it just at the level needed to deal with current circumstances? But fight, fight, and freeze are something that can really get stuck on the wrong response. If our body has learned previously that this is how to get out of a bad situation, then it's going to want to go back to its favorite response. And sometimes it can generalize that favorite response or sequence of responses to a situation where it doesn't really fit very well. So this really illustrates that our fight, fight, and freeze response can be maladaptive in our current situation. In the COVID-19 pandemic, it's generally agreed that the best response is to relax. Easier said than done, right? But relaxation or coming in to rest and digest, a more parasympathetically dominant state, that makes all this energy that was caught up in the muscles and the cardiovascular system is ready to go. That life energy becomes available instead to run our immune system. Our immune system is really a big deal in this current threat that we're under. We really want to support it. But in practice, this can be very difficult when our body's stuck in a fight, flight, or freeze response. So another unique aspect of living during a global pandemic has to do with social engagement. Basically, being around other people, especially trusted other people, is a major way that our nervous systems come out of stress and into well-being. However, that is oftentimes the wrong response in the situation that we're in. We're literally wired for togetherness. We have neurons in our brain called mirror neurons, which sense what's going on with other people, and it makes our system respond to that before we're even aware of it, before we even know what's happening. We are so wired to be together. However, in this instance, being together spreads the virus, right? So there's a lot of people in isolation, and a lot of us in the mental health field are concerned about the long-term effects of this isolation that's coming as a necessary measure to contain and slow the spread of the virus. So here's a picture of some meerkats. As a naturalist, I love animals. I love learning about them and observing them, and they just really make me feel good. Aren't they cute? These little critters are not happy when they're isolated. 
they come in packs, they work together, each one has a chore. We're just like that, really. We're a little more complex than meerkats, and there's some individual variation about social engagement in humans. Like, some people are more introverted, who regain energy more by being alone, and some people are more extroverted, who charge up their batteries by being around other people. As a total tangent to this video, some of that can be inherent, like some people are born into being more ex introverted or extroverted, and some of it may be a learned trauma response if people have grown up with some developmental trauma and there's a conflict set up where the people that we need most and are supposed to feel best being around, those people are the ones that hurt us the most. So as in avoidant attachment, which is a whole nother tangent that I won't get into, it's definitely a video for another time, when people learn that it's safer to draw back and be alone instead of with other people, that can sometimes be confounded with true introversion. At any rate, generally as a species, we're wired for each other. And a very interesting nuance of this pandemic is that we cannot access that as readily, which makes self-regulation a lot more difficult. I'm gonna link a very good video in the description by the founder of polyvagal theory, Dr. Stephen Porges, his suggestions for how to counter the effects of social distancing for the benefit of our health and well-being. So another rather unusual aspect of living in a global pandemic is where do we put our attention? We might find ourselves being pulled in multiple directions. On the individual or immediate family level, there's, am I going to stay healthy? Are my loved ones going to stay healthy? Am I going to be able to pay my bills? What happens if I can't? We'll call that an individual or close to individual in, in our immediate families. There's also deeper concerns that we can call, we can summarize it under eco-anxiety, which is basically, I've got some videos on eco-anxiety. It's the distress that we feel inside when we know about our natural environment being devastated and will the natural environment continue to support us. It's generally pretty well known that this specific virus came from a way of interacting with animals which was out of balance and would transmit pathogens or make it easier for pathogens to jump from an animal species to us. This is far from the only instance of this happening. I learned that HIV came from hunting chimps for meat, chimpanzees, there's also Ebola, there's the SARS virus. This is not a unique situation. Maybe it's unique in how it's spreading around the globe right now, but this is far from the only thing like this that we're encountering. So we've got individual concerns, we've got global concerns, what's happening to our environment, how can we stop destroying it, is it going to support us, is it going to support life? my children, my grandchildren, what's happening with this? And we can feel pulled in different directions and this can be really difficult to balance, which again, increases anxiety, sense of disorganization, sense of not being able to take effective actions. So this is overall a fairly unique and bewildering situation. Let's move on to some possible practices that people may find helpful in reorganizing ourselves and starting to move forward effectively, feeling less stuck. These are suggestions for exploration. Sometimes if you frame something a certain way, it might help people mobilize or start to consider things in a more effective manner. These are not treatment recommendations. I can't treat anybody I haven't met, can't tell anybody what to do. If you feel like some of these might apply to you, then I really encourage you to do your own research, continue to explore, and don't give up until you find something that helps you get into better balance. In keeping with that, my first suggestion for consideration is seeking individual guidance. Humans rely on each other. We went over that. We co-regulate. Having somebody else's nervous system who's available and stable to help you is immensely helpful for a wide number of people, including myself. There are many of us mental health practitioners and somatic practitioners who have moved our practices online. 
so that people can get help safely despite the need for social distancing. I've been resisting telehealth for years. Oh God, no, just didn't want any part of that. You know what? I am amazed at how effective I've seen it for so many of the folks I'm working with. You can still access uh, social engagement, what we call ventral vagal regulation, which is two nervous systems regulating each other. You can still access coming out of threat response a lot more effectively than I'd ever thought. So there's lots of us mental health practitioners who are online. Many of us are dropping our fees or making our fees negotiable so that people are still able to get help during this time of uncertainty. So remember that. And here's another important suggestion. You may have seen some internet memes going on about this. Please, people, be easy on yourselves with respect to the tendency to beat ourselves up. Um, I have all this time. I should be getting in the best shape of my life. My closet should be totally clean. Oh, I could get all my garage in order, my finances in order. I could do that art project I've been putting off. You know what? To treat yourself like this completely ignores the extra load on our systems from the new reality that we're living in. So please don't just look at your emptying calendar and say, well, I got to do this, 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 this. We need some time to adjust. We need some time to reorganize, ground, settle, and figure out how to mobilize under new circumstances. So please, let's not beat ourselves up too much. It's not a good practice. Uh, that's different from being completely laissez-faire with oneself. You don't want to use it as an excuse to just sit there and do nothing. Some days you might just need to sit there and do nothing. See, that's why I can't give recommendations. Everybody's situation is so unique. But beating oneself up is generally known in the mental health field to not be a good practice for mental health well-being or sustainable. My next suggestion for consideration involves supporting our immune systems. From a non-medical self-regulation perspective, we're just finite little envelopes of life energy here in this fleshy body that we walk around in, and there's only so much of it. So you can be funneling it into a stress response that's really not going anywhere, because like I said, you can't punch a virus, you can't run away from the economy, really. Or you can, instead of that energy being all up in the stress response, it can come down back into the body to self-regulate. That is being a more rest and digest parasympathetic response. And that's where our immune system is more supported. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed that you get more sick when you're under a lot of stress, or it's often known that after a really stressful event, that can be sort of the precipitation for people coming down with major autoimmune disorders. And this, we think, is why. Stress kills. So the, most, the more that people can do to come out of stress and into things that support our immune system, the better we're all going to fare during this global pandemic. As a side note to that, if you're struggling with any addictions, that's really not a good thing for the physical body. Really do consider getting your self-treatment, individual help, even the 12 steps or rational recovery or something like that, which are free. So supporting our immune systems. We talked about humans not being solitary creatures by our very nature, by the way that we're wired for survival. So social engagement is really important. And again, it's paradoxical because that's kind of what's being taken away from us to sustain life and containing the spread of the virus. Fortunately for us, we have knowledge about how not to spread the virus, so we can use that knowledge to make other ways to engage with each other. We regulate especially through seeing each other's faces, through hearing each other's voices, the tones and nuances of our voices, we can do that through even watching TV, watching comedy. Laughter is so important. It just gets us right out of a stress response. Um, hearing each other's voices, seeing each other's faces, phone calls, FaceTime, Zoom, all those. I'm sure the telehealth and, and teleconferencing servers are really overloaded these days. Thank you for making this available to us to help us get through these difficult times. You can be a safe distance away from people like wave high, people going down the street. I've heard of uh, people doing drive 
buy hellos in their cars so that you've got the social distancing and even the glass, but you can see each other. There's so many creative ways to stay in touch with other people. I think that will help us quite a bit in terms of our self-regulation. Movement is another good one. It gives our all that energy that our body might be call, calling up in the stress response. It gives it something to do instead of rattle around inside us and continue to bother us. It's important that people find movements that they can do. Some people have limited mobility. They can imagine movement in their mind. Just imagine what it would be like to stretch the legs or the arms and really feel into that. You, can, you know, people need to find ways to move that are appropriate to their individual situation. Somebody in the country who doesn't have a high crime area it might have more access to going for a long walk than somebody who either is mobility limited or lives in an urban environment that might be higher crime. Finding ways to move maybe in one's own home that can just help kind of that energy move through our bodies instead of being stuck. The topic of grief is a big one, and unfortunately, it's one that a lot of people like to avoid. And there's a lot of mechanisms in our society for avoiding that, including staying busy, drinking too much alcohol, you name it. There's so many of them. But there's a lot of grief around these days. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, there's a lot of loss and potential for loss. And sometimes external instability in the larger social environment brings up things from our core that maybe we hadn't dealt with. Grief work is a big deal. There's a lot of resources online for it. I can link some in the description below. Grief basically involves just being with it, just sitting there and being with your feelings and feeling it until it goes away. But you have to do so in the window of tolerance. Everybody's got a certain limit as to their own emotions, how much of it they can handle at one time. So staying within one's uh, ability to be with it without flooding or numbing, right? See, you can see the grief work is its own topic. I'll link some resources in the description below. But this is an important time to weave in and out of grief as we're capable of it and again getting oneself individual support there's support groups online for grief some churches have it uh, there's some good resources that i'll put in the description below so a lot of what we have to do to respond to a global pandemic situation involves taking really good care of ourselves and our families and our communities it involves coming out of stress response, it, out of that high fight or flight charge that can be so hard on our bodies. Sometimes it is time to take action from a grounded and well-regulated place, hopefully. And again, individual support can be really helpful in finding this balance. Um, one of the actions that I personally believe it's very important to take is to insist that we take better care of the natural world. This can have selfish implications like if we're not creating terrible conditions that can create such pathogens in a widespread fashion, you know, it, it can affect us individually, but also it deals with that eco-anxiety and that eco-grief that we were talking about. I mean, nobody wants to see the natural world burn or perish or become paved over. Here's our chance. When things are unusual and unstable and the way that we've been doing things is all called into question. This is this can be a time to insist that things are done in a more life-supportive manner. For example, if we don't like the current rollbacks in the United States are happening of an, uh, EPA protections, we can write, we can email, we can call, we can insist that our natural environment be protected. We can take action about factory farms, deforestation, habitat loss. Now, I don't really this is not a, not a political channel I feel like the well-being of life on this planet you can't just dismiss it as being political I mean it's really the bottom line for everything that life can continue to exist on this planet or not and that involves taking good care of the biosphere it can be in a larger sense such as contacting your elected representatives and insisting that we stop practices that are demolishing the planet's ability to sustain us and other species it can be as simple as going out with a bag and picking up trash in your own local neighborhood, which I do. Of course, stay safe. You might want to wear a mask and gloves. 
do I have to tell you, don't throw your gloves on the ground. There's been way too many people throwing their mask and glove on the ground. Not cool, okay? For people who feel healthy and robust enough to pick up trash, it's a very simple thing that we can do to protect our ocean ecosystems and, and our wildlife. There's so many ways to get involved, but insisting that the thin envelope of soil and oxygen and stable climate on this planet that makes life all possible, insisting that that be taken good care of. And again, that can shift some of the stress and uncertainty into a sense of taking action that's effective. That can really lower our internal stress levels. which leads us right to the importance of honoring and preserving our connection to nature and the natural world. That's intensely self-regulating for most people. We're part of nature. Nature is us. Nature's in us. We are nature. Every bit of what's keeping me alive right now as I'm recording this video is a squishy, earthy, biological process. I'm breathing in oxygen. Molecules have gone through all these uh, earthy cycles They've been through plants, they've been through the atmosphere, they've been through the oceans. Um, every bit of flesh that I'm walking around in right now was a part of something else at one point. As a city dweller, we might tend to forget this and we might feel a bit scared of nature or taken aback because we might not have had the chance to develop the skill set to exist safely in nature, but nature is very flexible and there's many ways to experience our connection with it. Um, anything from watching a movie to interacting with animals to if this is a great time to adopt an animal. If you have the means and, and the people in the household to make sure that's well cared for even after this pandemic is over with and more settled. But anyway, there's so many ways to connect with nature. It's said that we really shouldn't be going to national parks right now. One of my favorite places to spend time in nature that just gets me right in the heart in a good way every single time is the Eastern Sierras. I love going to the Eastern Sierras. It's just breathtakingly, awe-strikingly beautiful. Um, right now, I understand that Mono County has a lot of COVID, where, where the Sierras are located or partly located. These areas may have a lot of COVID-19 cases and it could be really easy to overwhelm their medical system if we have a car accident or get sick up there. So maybe connecting to it through other means, through our screens, through gardening, through just remembering trips that we've had to nature, connecting with our pets, um, thinking about our nature story. That's a really basic eco-therapy ther intervention. Tell your nature story. Feel what feels good about it. Put it down on paper. Tell it to somebody else. There's lots of ways to connect with nature and notice the self-regulation that happens as a result. The last suggestion I have to share with you in today's video relates to slowing down. You may have noticed that things are slowing down a lot, unless you're working in a grocery store, thank you, or you're an Amazon worker, or you're in the medical field, or in the supply chain. If you're doing one of those essential tasks, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. For the rest of us, things might be slowing down a lot, a lot, you know, and that might be very different than how we're used to living our lives, which, whoa, that's something else our nervous system has to adjust to, right? So, you could be curious, what, what's it like to just be in that slowness? As the demands on you maybe slow down, what does your nervous system do with it? Does it speed up? Is that speed up useful at all to the current circumstance? Do you feel like you're racing with nowhere to go? Again, this might be time to seek help from a somatic practitioner or other mental health professional. Just being really curious what happens in our nervous systems as the slowness and the normal rhythms of life are changing from what we're used to. I think it's useful to make a distinction between slow and numb. That can be a really subtle distinction for many people. Just because you're not feeling racy or anxious doesn't mean that there's not any under the surface. So I've got some other videos on this channel 
um, somatic experiencing has a lot of wonderful books and lots of material out there. It's, um, I've got a video on the felt sense to start to distinguish between what's slow and present versus what's numb. But again, the overview of this suggestion for exploration is just noticing what's happening in our bodies as the outer demands or as the rhythms of life might be a lot slower than we're used to. How does our body respond to that and is that a useful response? And so to sum up the longest video I've ever offered, I really hope that this is helpful and supportive to people just people out there trying to find our way through a new world situation and taking into consideration our internal operating system, sometimes having an increased awareness as to how humans work. I've often felt like, for me, I felt like somatic experiencing has given me not exactly the operating manual for this human body and human condition that I inherited at birth, but something kind of close to that. Thank goodness for somatic psychotherapy. It's been so useful. And eco-psychology as well. Knowing how we operate, knowing how humans are wired, and just being able to elucidate some of the conditions that we're facing, I'm hoping that that can be helpful to help us start to get through, help point us in the right direction. In some cases, we may come out stronger than ever. As always, please seek individual help if you need it. This video is not individual or, or group psychotherapy advice for anybody. It's a starting point. This is a chance to do some things differently. Um, there's already some improvements like the cleaner air and animals, wildlife coming back. Let's keep our eye on what the change that we want to see in the world and ask ourselves what can we do to contribute. So thank you for watching this video. Stay tuned. There's more in the works. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like to support my work of getting this information out into the world, you could subscribe to receive notification of future videos, you could contribute to my Patreon account to support this channel, and of course please feel free to share this video with others. Take care, until next time, be well.